Okay, we're going to get started. Uh, before I introduce our speakers, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping details for the webinar. Uh, thank you again if you just joined in the last minute or two. Uh, everyone will be in listen-only mode throughout the webinar. Uh, if you have a question or issues, please enter it into the chat box. Uh, secondly, we will be reading and answering questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, third, the webinar is being recorded. A replay of the webinar and the slides uh, can be made available to you and we will do a follow-up for that. Um, now I'd like to introduce you to your speakers today. Chris Hednagy is, a, is the founder and CEO of Social Engineer Incorporated. Chris possesses over 16 years of experience as a practitioner and researcher in the security field. His efforts in training, education, and awareness have helped to expose social engineering at the top threat of the security of organizations today. Chris has spoken and trained at events such as RSA, Black Hat, and various presentations for corporate and government clients. Chris is also the best-selling author of two books, Social Engineering, The Art of Human Hacking, and Unmasking the Social Engineer, The Human Element of Security. Michelle Fincher is the Chief Influencing Agent of Social Engineer Incorporated, possessing over 20 years' experience as a behavioral scientist, researcher, and information security professional. Michelle is an often requested trainer and speaker on various technical and behavioral subjects for law enforcement, the intelligence community, and the private sector in venues including the Black Hat Briefings, RSA, Techno Security, and the Advanced Practical Social Engineering Training Course. Joe Ferreira is the President and CEO of Wombat Security Technologies. He has provided expert commentary and has spoken at numerous information security industry events including RSA Europe, the CISO Executive Network Forum, ISSA International and Information Security Regional Conferences. His security awareness articles have been published in Network World, CSO Magazine, Tech World, FearC.io, Computer World, and many more. With that, I'll turn the webinar over to Chris. Good morning. Let me get my screen shared. Okay, I believe all of you should be able to see my screen at this point, and let's get the presentation going. Okay, well, welcome everybody. Uh, we're happy to be here with uh, with Wombat and talking about the DEF CON 22 Social Engineering Capture the Flag, um, especially because of the uh, importance of the data that we collected. Let me just briefly uh, give a little bit of background on the competition. Um, most of you uh, hopefully are aware of what the competition is. It's a social engineering capture the flag, in essence, um, kind of like a hardware or network capture the flag, but the flags are bits of data that are obtained from companies that are called. This year, our, our uh, theme was a tag team competition. Uh, that meant we had two people in the booth at all times, and uh, they worked as a team. And this presented some challenges, uh, we hoped, for the social engineers. Uh, for the contestants because they had to uh, think of pretext that would allow them to share the booth, share the mic, and explain to the people on the phone why there were two people speaking to them. And of course that would add some complexity. Uh, this year we had 18 uh, contestants or social engineers, nine target companies, and the contest itself only consists of open source information as well as data collected on the phone. Uh, we have a lot of strict rules we put in place that have been uh, formulated working with the EFF and other groups that help keep the competition uh, moving and, and uh, out, of that, out of that dark zone. So let's talk a little bit about what we found this year. Um, our process was, um, our, our industry this year was retail. And the reason that was chosen was um, obviously what you see in the news over the last, I'd say, 12 to 16 months has been heavily focused on retail and we wanted to see if uh, because we focus so much on hacking attacks in the news to see if social engineering was a vector that was being trained and educated on um, during the during the competition in the retail industry. Uh, when I talked to, briefly about OSI before, uh, what I mean by that is open source intelligence. That's what OSI stands for. And the contestants can only use things like Google and Twitter and Facebook uh, nothing that involved them accessing a database that would be owned or a private website that would be owned by these target companies. Uh, they could only do things that were completely open on the web. 
So that would be like any search going to Google and looking for a company and finding information about them there. Um, at DEF CON, the, the next section, um, after they write the report, which is based on all that OSI information, then they have to make phone calls at DEF CON. We didn't use any caller ID spoofing, which we thought would add another layer of complexity for the contestants. Uh, so they had to make their calls um, at DEF CON in the booth in front of the, the room ranged anywhere from a couple hundred people up to four or five hundred people at a time and uh, the calls were made there uh, to these uh, to the companies trying to obtain the same flags that they found uh, on the OSI portion. And the points are awarded for these flags. Um, we'll have a, a list of some of them later, but flags like do you block websites, is wireless used on site, a lot of yes or no answers uh, trying to, to get the person on the phone to give this information over and then points were awarded. I think um, what's also really important to stress is that both within our rules of engagement um, and, and our process, uh, we try to really make sure that no one is compromised and no one is victimized as part of this competition and that includes the target companies as well. So we, we do a lot to try to protect the target companies both in terms of the amount of information and what, what our contestants are allowed to collect as well as their conduct and behavior on the phone as well and I think that's a really important point for people to know. And that kind of was a nice lead into what was the information we were looking for. Uh, here's an example of some of the flags uh, that, were, that were being asked. Um, Browsers that were used, version of browsers, antivirus, operating system. You can read this list here. There's also a full list um, on the on the website, uh, which is social-engineer.org, not engineering, but um, um, you can get the report there and see a list of all the flags inside that report and uh, see the different point values that would be there for them. And what, like Michelle just said, our goal is not to get personal identifying information on the actual individual on the phone, uh, but to get these flags from the company and then to see, uh, again, the, the point being to not prove that Sally, Joe, Chris, Michelle, whoever is on that phone call is insecure, but that um, unskilled, untrained people on the phone could get others to give over information that probably shouldn't be given on a phone call without verification. So these questions, uh, these flags are obviously uh, quite detailed. There's, there's maybe 30, 35 of them or so that you could take a look at. And, um, and that, that brings up the question then of what pretext would be used in order to obtain this information. And uh, this chart talks a little bit about the pretext uh, that, that we saw this year, um, the largest being corporate IT. So we see that over 50% of the contestants use the corporate IT um, uh, pretext, which means that they, they made believe they were from the company's corporate IT department. Uh, next, uh, we see tech support, corporate HR, auditors, and internal support. And the reason I put all those before we talk about the other one is uh, because those are all very similar pretexts, but they all involve them coming from the company itself. There was a really small slice there of people that we saw actually be customers of these retail organizations. Um, and trying to obtain some of this information as a customer pretext. So some very interesting data here this time. And I think something to really think about is that in past contests, what we have seen are pretexts that are not quite as successful like job seekers and students. And we believe because of the tag out condition that we placed this year, that it really made people much more sort of um, prone to creating good valid pretext and doing a lot of research and being very believable in their presentations to their targets as well. Excellent. Which um, the, the, the corporate IT pretext is something that's really important for us to take note of um, because uh, of course there should be some, some clear defined rules for those who are making calls of how they can identify that this person is from their internal support or tech support or HR or IT department. So that we'll get to that a, a little bit later. Um, but let's take a look at this next chart, which is the flag frequency. So again, this is not based on point value, this particular chart. This is on how many times the flag itself was asked and answered. So what's important to note on this chart is it's not how many times it was asked. So if a flag was asked and the person either didn't answer, rejected to answer, 
um, caught the social engineer and, and hung up or whatever, any type of, of, of reason that the answer was not given, then that's not marked here. Uh, the blue represents the reporting piece, and the red represents the calls. So blue being the OSI, uh, OSINT portion, and the red representing the phone calls done at DEF CON. And some interesting things you can see is the most widely obtained flag was, is there wireless on site, followed by um, a very personal question, which is how long that particular individual has been with the company. Um, but if you look across the line, some of the ones that should be really interesting to all of us here are things like awareness training. That was a very high uh, valued flag, and it was also one that was answered and uh, asked and answered quite often uh, how many times awareness training was given. Um, and then other ones like websites that are being blocked, uh, security guards, badges. These are all very high profile flags and high frequency answer flags are important for us to note because, um, uh, of course, these can uh, be information that should not be given out over the phone. So this leads us to taking a look at the actual companies that were called. Our nine companies, as listed here, were Home Depot, CVS, Walmart, Rite Aid, Costco, Staples, Walgreens, Macy's, and Lowe's. And this chart represents how they ranked in the competition. Now what's important to note here is this is not a company ranking as far as their security posture in the industry. Uh, we cannot speak to that. This is how these individual companies did during those two days at DEF CON in August 2014 uh, during this particular competition. Uh, so the point value, as you see here, the higher the points, that means the more information the company gave. So in essence, it's not a winning mark. It's uh, the higher the points means the more information that the social engineers obtained, which means that the worst that the company did during the competition. And this chart here represents from the most, uh, the highest points down to the least amount of points that were obtained here on uh, this company ranking. <clears throat> so with all of this detail that we have here in the different charts, of course the question comes up often is, is uh, what, what can be done? How can a company protect themselves from social engineering? So we have a few different pointers here that we always talk about when it comes to uh, social engineering mitigation. And the first being defensive actions. And, and this is an interesting one because this is really subjective to your company, your people, how you work, um, what type of company you have. And that is setting clear definitions for what is and is not allowed when it comes to things like social media, posting corporate information. We have some companies who are very prolific on, on social media. They have their Twitter accounts and LinkedIn accounts and Facebook accounts, and they're all over the Internet talking about their company and allowing their employees to post, and that's excellent. And um, other companies are more strict with that, but it's important to help employees to understand the value of the information they hold. Yeah, and I think a really really important point for companies to consider also is that a lot of employees have social media and don't really make the attachment that their personal social media, what effect that might have on the company itself. So if they're posting that they're going on vacation, for instance, they may not connect that to any sort of relevance related to who they work for, and yet somebody that's malicious can absolutely use that information to attempt different ways to infiltrate the company. And I think that's really important for people to be aware of as, as employees of companies as well. Yeah, very good point. <clears throat> so these defensive actions is our first step that we always talk about with companies when it comes to mitigating social engineering. The next is realistic pen testing. And the reason we label it as realistic pen testing is um, any company that's in security can run a vulnerability scan, uh, whether that's a social engineering or a network vulnerability scan. Uh, but realistic pen testing means being able to not just uncover the vulnerabilities, but conduct uh, real social engineering attacks on the vectors, on the, um, the vulnerabilities that are found. So being able to look at the information that's out there, identify how vulnerable it is, and then plan realistic attack vectors um, that don't just lead to, of course, people, employees, companies being embarrassed, but the goal is to use that information to develop education. And, and that is really the important point of realistic pen testing, is finding a company that has the ability to think like the bad guys, but knowing that they are the good guys. So they're there to help you and your employees and, and show the value of 
your company and your people in the way that they conduct these penetration tests. And, and thirdly, and probably most importantly, is security awareness. Uh, training needs to be practical. It needs to be interactive. And it needs to be consistent. And that's probably one of the most important points that we talk about to companies all the time, is if you have a non-engaging security awareness program that happens once a year, um, it will not be as effective as a consistent, interactive, and engaging security awareness program. And that is, that is really important. Uh, looking at companies like Wombat that have that real engaging piece of security awareness is important when you're thinking about um, how to conduct security awareness. We all learn in different ways, but one thing that's common um, to all of us is when, when things are inter when engaging and interactive, we tend to retain them more. And I think um, one, one additional really important point with respect to security awareness training is its relevance and and dynamic response to current events. Clearly, we have um, phishing attacks that are occurring more frequently now, and the better that your organizations are able to respond to current events to make those relevant to your employees, I think the more impactful that has the potential to be in, in, and in terms of effectiveness. Yeah, very good point. So what's our conclusions here for the, um, uh, for the DEF CON social engineering competition? Well, social engineering continues to be a significant risk uh, to individuals and organizations. Taking a look at the stories over the last year, uh, if you look at the individual level, you're seeing uh, these attackers attacking your grandmother and grandfather using the, the scams about your, your grandson, their grandson being imprisoned in some foreign country. Uh, you're seeing phishing emails, vishing calls, and impersonation attacks on the rise across the board in this country and, and across the world. Uh, being used to breach companies almost every day. We're seeing a new report of that. And, and despite these reports, despite the fact that every time you look at a newspaper or turn on the, uh, you open up your browser and go to a new site, that there's a high profile breach, um, there's not consistent improvements that directly address the human factor. And a clear indicator of that is how many times um, these attacks occur and the focus will be so much on the database that was breached, the credit cards that were stolen, but then later on, you know, down the road, you hear that, oh, yep, it was a phishing email, and that seems to slide under the the carpet. And um, as it as a whole, if we continue to ignore that human factor in these high-profile breaches, uh, then this problem will will never get better. So the two takeaways um, here is that it continues to be a huge risk, and that we need to focus on the human aspect of these breaches so we can continually work on combating it and mitigating these attacks. Now I'd like to hand uh, this part over back to, uh, to Joe so he can uh, talk to you a little about effective security awareness training. All right. Thanks, Chris. Um, no problem. A little plug for Chris and Michelle. I, mean, I have attended the, the event and watched it in live in action. It is a fantastic event at, at DEF CON to go watch. Uh, it's really incredible to watch the, the people work the phones and get people to do things that they really shouldn't do. That's a really interesting program that they put on every year. So I'm going to talk about um, really two things, um, but really focus on security awareness. Um, two being two mitigating items that, that Chris and Michelle talked about, um, slightly on realistic pen test and then about security awareness. So uh, I'm, I'm going to do it in the context of talking about our training methodology and um, what we, what we um, talk about when we talk to customers and, and the methodology, but I'm also going to uh, take you through a case study at the end of a customer that we worked with most recently and how they were able to attack this this issue and, and do, again, some of the mitigating items that um, Chris and Michelle were talking about. So in terms of our methodology, uh, we have a continuous training methodology. So different from, uh, you know, security awareness once a year, our methodology really is a year-round process where we're looking at doing continuous improvement loops, if you will, um, specifically to attack this um, user uh, education issue. So starting at 12 o'clock, uh, essentially the initiation point for us when we're um, talking about 
um, our methodology is that we use knowledge assessments and mock attacks. Um, we use them to, one, understand where the vulnerabilities are within an organization. So if you're running a knowledge assessment, that's understanding really what are the knowledge levels across the organization and different teams, what topics do people have issues with. And then we also run mock attacks, um, similar to a pen test. Uh, in that we're trying to catch people in the act whenever they fall for a simulated phishing attack or a simulated uh, smishing attack. Uh, but we'll take that opportunity when they fall for that to teach them. Now, in terms of that assessment, we're getting an idea of the vulnerability of an organization um, to that specific attack. Now, as, as Chris said, it's really only to that attack. It's not that you can say, well, this this company failed um, miserably, you know, yes or no on one specific attack. It's really whether or not they were vulnerable to that, that specific attack on that specific day. Um, but we use that really as the initiation point uh, of our methodology in that we'd like to take a measurement up front so that we know uh, where we're going from that point forward and we can measure our results. And now from that point, we go into education. Um, we use interactive and, and game-based training modules they're all software-based, so it's not video and it's not um, slideware and it's not classroom-based training. These are truly getting people to interact, and I'll, I'll talk about this a little bit more. Um, then we reinforce with posters, articles, newsletters. What you're trying to do is get the concepts and the teaching uh, topics and reinforce it with imagery and also messaging so that people um, learn and internalize the, the concepts that you're talking about. And then lastly, measure and then repeat the process. So we're looking at detailed measurements um, through our, our software um, to understand where the vulnerabilities in an organization are, whether that's people or topic areas. Um, so then you have actionable data as you go forward to be able to attack those specific issues. Um, so kind of walking through the methodology, if I can get my uh, PC to move. Um, so from an assessments and mock attacks, uh, we look at this in simplistic terms of putting people into situations, situations that they're going to come across in their daily work environment. Um, we put them into situations because we know that if we uh, give a scenario or a story, uh, that people again can relate to that and it becomes much more applicable to their own uh, role. And in our case, what we're doing is putting them into scenarios, having them answer questions, and at the same time, we gather those baseline results. Um, at the same time, I talked about before, we also run mock attacks. This mock attack uh, was a phishing email we just ran recently for a customer. In this case, it was after a party that they had thrown or an event that they had thrown. And the next, uh, within the next week, we sent off an email that said, hey, I want you to uh, look at this after party video. Just click here to get to it. And we had about 75% of the people who fall for that attack. But you can see why that would be motivating for people to fall for it um, because of the fact that it was relevant to what they did. They knew that they attended this event. And, and you can see how attackers would take up this um, type, of a, uh, type of attack mode as well. Uh, again, what we try to do is use that teachable moment whenever they fall for the attack um, and show them. In our case, we tend to put it into context by actually embedding. If you look at this teachable moment uh, example, you can literally see the email that we used in that case. That, that provides context uh, to that user so that they can really see what they should have picked up in that phishing email or in that simulated attack. Now, the reality is, is that when you do simulated attacks and that teachable moment when they fall for it, you only have about 30 to 60 seconds. So it's not uh, you know, in-depth education. You're not going to be able to cover in the depth that you really want to go with an end user so that they can arm themselves going forward. But it's a great motivating factor. Um, we've seen it time and time again that you know, when you prime a user population with simulated attacks, that you can get them more easily to take uh, training, voluntary or mandatory, either way, after the fact. Um, so it is a motivating factor, um, and it provides really that, that impetus to, to move forward with initial or additional training. 
Now, when we talk about in-depth training, again, um, as I said, it, it's really we use uh, game-based interactive, interactive training modules. Um, we break it down. We call it in-depth, but the reality is, is that we break it into bite-sized pieces uh, because we know um, from learning science that if I douse somebody with fire hose for an hour um, with a video, they're not going to uh, take away much from that hour-long video. So we break it down into roughly 10-minute segments um, focus on individual topics. We do a lot of learning by doing, again, stories and scenarios so it becomes uh, relevant to the to the end users. Uh, we use a lot of um, immediate feedback. Uh, so I'll call these like micro teachable moments, if you will. So in this, in this case on the screen, we're talking about email security. So in the case of email security, we'll literally mimic a, an email client um, because again, we want to get it as close to realistic as we can within the concept, context of training. So in this case, we're asking about an email. When they provide answers, we give them feedback. Whether it's a right answer, wrong answer, it doesn't matter. We'll still give them feedback as to why. Um, because we know, again, that, that people will learn and retain that information longer if we can get them that uh, positive reinforcement when they get it right with the reasons or um, reinforcement when they, when they get the answer wrong, but tell them why they got it wrong. Now, the great thing for us is that uh, because everything's software-based that we work with, uh, we're collecting valuable data throughout the entire time. So instead of just uh, check the box what percentage of people took training, uh, we literally are getting down into individual topic areas or uh, individual employees that have issues. Um, so it's, it becomes much more actionable data once you have collected it. You can look at it. You can understand what the trends are in your um, organization and, and then react to it. Um, so to give you an idea of how successful this can be for a company that rolls out a program, continuous education program like this for security, uh, we recently, uh, actually today, just put out a press release on a case study uh, so it's out on our website at wombatsecurity.com. Um, but a manufacturing company that we worked with, 5,000 employees, uh, they came to us and wanted to roll out a program. Uh, they were getting a lot of questions from their board, and they wanted to um, really take a measured approach. They wanted to be able to understand what the changes were when they rolled out a uh, security education program. So they ended up rolling out a program over the course of four months, um, they did security training modules, again, interactive training modules, uh, coupled with simulated phishing attacks. What they saw in terms of reaction to that or results from that, they saw a 46% reduction in malware infections, uh, going from an average of 72 per day to 39 per day. And this is just through education of the end user uh, population. Some of the different regions had um, higher and lower reductions, uh, Europe, in this case, almost a 70% reduction. Uh, they also saw a 40% reduction in help desk calls from um, 32 to 20 per month. Um, and they did their own internal ROI based on this program that they rolled out and calculated more than a 700% ROI, um, purely based on the cost to remediate or clean up or, and re-image machines um, that were infected. I find this interesting because they didn't include anything else um, like lost productivity or any other um, cost calculations into this uh, return on investment model. Uh, and at the same time, they used an incredibly low uh, cost for remediation of $35 per infected machine. Now, from my conversations with other customers, uh, realistically, I think the average cost to uh, remediate from an infection is probably more in the hundred plus um, to thousands of dollars, depending on the industry. On the thousands of dollars uh, for remediation, that would be more in a banking or financial situation where you have to recertify the machine uh, based on regulatory issues. So it's safe to say that 700% uh, ROI is very, very conservative. Um, and they got great positive uh, user feedback but they also had a great rapport build up with the board. Um, so their board of directors were following the results all the way along. Their security team and um, security officer uh, really had a great interaction with the board because the board was really grappling with getting their hands around um, security. 
um, the business has been around for a long time, but they're really just getting up to speed on security issues. Um, so really positive results. I think that in the end, um, it can be a great return on investment, but I think the, the most positive thing was the reaction with the end users, and, and the security officer felt like that was the biggest um, goal at the end of the day, or the biggest result, was the fact that they had a, a better engagement with the user population, um, and they understood that they were part of the solution. Um, so he thought that that was the, the biggest result out of anything. So with that, I'll turn it back and we'll see if there's any questions. Um, who's going to handle questions? Oh, we do not have any questions. I just wanted to clarify that we will be uh, following up with everybody who attended this webinar. Uh, and thank you, everybody, for your time. We will have a, an email with a PDF of the results. And we will also upload the video so um, you and members of your staff can uh, watch the webinar again and listen to it. So check no. I'll just make sure there aren't any. Yeah, questions. just yeah. double check. I don't have any. Yeah. yeah, there's one question. Oh, okay. We have one question. Um, what are your recommendations for getting uh, buy-in for security education programs? I'm guessing that is for uh, executives and, and the board, just as we were discussing. Um, so I'll take this, and then uh, Chris and Michelle, feel free to to jump in. Um, so I've seen a lot of uh, people justify uh, the purchases uh, and get buy-in from the executive team in a lot of different ways. One is building a business case and building, uh, you know, an expect a, a expectation in terms of results as you move forward. Um, the other way that I've seen it done is that us, uh, our companies like ourselves, will actually run. Uh, a simulated attack for you to get a small portion of your organization to understand what the results are. I've seen people turn around and use that as ammunition to get buy-in from the senior uh, team. In an extreme example, uh, we had um, a customer that ran a simulated a, a phishing attack during a board meeting and, and sent it out to the executive team and the, and the board that was involved in the meeting and then turned around and used that uh, to show the board really that, the, that they are vulnerable and that the employees are vulnerable. So that's an extreme example. That was a, a security officer that was very comfortable in his role and in his job. Um, not necessarily recommend that across the board for anybody who wants to do it, but you know, again, it, it's a good way. You could do it across a small um, user population just to get an idea and get results that you could take back um, so that, that people understand the, the vulnerability. And I think to Chris's point before, um, we're seeing this over and over and over again is that the vulnerability is still out there. Chris, Michelle, anything that you would add? <clears throat> um, we find also in addition, I think your, your suggestions were excellent, uh, and in addition, you know, it's an educational process for, for management, um, giving them some um, concept of what's happening in the market, right? So they hear the stories. People know that Home Depot, Target, you know, they know these places have been breached. But showing them how it happened, showing them that it was one USB key or it was this phishing email. Uh, so they start to see, wow, I mean, all of that stuff I'm reading in the news was from one phishing email. And then they begin to realize how big of a problem one phishing email was. and and you know, to ask the question, then are, are, are people educated as to how to handle these things? And if you have any doubts at all, then the response is that education needs to occur. Uh, so we find it's more like an education process of the management if they're not willing to understand or if they don't get the value of security awareness, um, then, then we have to start there at the basics educating them. <clears throat> 